from, uh, from Everest. Uh, so he got his PhD in Cambridge with uh, Stephen Hawking, uh, and uh, then went to MIT and to Harvard. Uh, after he actually uh, you know, went west and uh, spent a few years at the Smith-Kelwell High Research Institute in uh, San Francisco. And uh, recently, he's been at UCLA for a number of years. He's a professor in two departments, uh, psychology and uh, statistics, uh, and soon also in CS. Uh, he wants to be a professor in as many departments as possible, uh, because it's boring otherwise. Uh, and also, he wants to point out that he's never been the professor in the department where he had a degree, which is also a <laughs> <laughs> And uh, today, we're going to talk about some of the work he's doing in uh, object recognition, detection, and tech detection in particular. And I think we've resolved the issue, so Alan, I think so. Okay, well, thank you very much for having me here. Uh, so I'm going to talk about work that's been done at the uh, Center for Vision and Image Sciences at UCLA, which I direct together with uh, Professor Song Chong Zhu. And uh, some of the work I'll describe will be mine, some will be joint, and some will be stuff that Song Chong uh, is doing by himself or in some interaction. So let's see, do I, is this working? Uh, so, uh, yeah, just for people who may not work in vision, this usually put up a default slide saying vision is hard because um, people often think it's really easy. Uh, why it's easy is our brains have evolved to do it. Um, you know, our intelligence is basically in our cortex and at least 50% of our cortex seems to be doing vision in one way or another. And so, uh, the, if you think about it in sort of intelligence terms, Vision is just looking at the room and interpreting it is arguably a far harder task than solving the most difficult mathematics problem or building the most complex software system. I was once hissed at a Harvard mathematics department for saying this, but I think it's still objectively true. Doing, doing vision and, you know, if you take away the vision part of your brain and the part that does motor control and a little bit that does language, there's not really very much left. So, uh, Intelligence is often what's going on at the level of vision and perception. Okay, so vision, well, you know, why is it hard? Well, vision requires decoding the image and passing it into components such as objects. And the difficulties are due to the fact that images are very complex and also extremely ambiguous. And one way of pointing this out was uh, the observation that if you look at all the possible images, which are just 10 by 10, 10 pixels, 10 pixels in the X direction, 10 pixels in the in the y direction and count out how many images there are, you see there are far more of those than all the images that have been seen by all humans over the whole period of evolutionary history. You know, allowing for how many billion humans have ever existed and you see 30 images a second and so on and you live, you know, on average 60, 78 years life. Nobody, you know, no one has seen all the possible 10 by 10 images. It's a very high dimensional space. It's a very complex space. Okay, so... Here is an example, a quick example to test your visual ability. So of these squares, this one and this one, which one is, is brighter? Has anyone seen this example before? They're the same, obviously. <laughs> ah. <laughs> yeah, very sophisticated people here, right. Uh, everyone's seen it by now. I still find some people who don't, but anyway. They're the same, but they look very different. And the reason, you know, the reason appears to be that when you look at an image like this, you're not just, your brain is not just registering the intensity that you're actually getting here directly. It's doing some complicated inference. It's figuring out that this thing seems to be in shadow of here, and so its intensity is actually different from what you actually perceive it to be. So it's doing an inverted uh, process. Okay. Okay, so here is a typical image illustrating, I think, Everest from the Tibetan side. Uh, illustrating some of the degrees of uh, complexity that you get in a visual scene. And the work that we're doing, uh, one part of it is related to what we called image passing, a paper that we published a couple of years back, which would give the sort of basic flavor of, of what we want to do. The idea being that an image, let's take this one, can be thought of as being composed of a number of different patterns, patterns for the person, patterns for their uh, you know, a, a hierarchical sort of representation of patterns. Here is the person, here is the face, here is the body, uh, here is the sports field. The sports field is made up of certain components. Um, the spectators are also made up of certain components, which could be texture of different types or, and sometimes sort of larger uh, elementary objects. 
So think of the visual world as being made up of a large number of these patterns uh, organized in some sort of hierarchical method like this. And then the idea of interpreting an image in our terminology would be passing it, taking the image and sort of decomposing it into patterns. So you can take this, this picture two ways. One way is you go up here, which means you take these patterns and you stick them together to make the image. The other is you start out with the image, you decode it by uh, taking it apart and getting this representation for it. And once you've done that, you have solved the problem of detecting objects in the image, uh, recognizing them, and understanding the, the entire thing. And so our approach was to formulate this in terms of generating the image by a probabilistic grammar. And uh, grammar allowing you to have a sort of fairly uh, le abstract level of knowledge representation, probabilistic so that things are uh, you know, not purely deterministic. Here is a very simple conceptual picture of this. The image would be a scene, it would contain a face, it would contain some text, and it would contain a certain amount of background. And so you could generate an image by coming up uh, you know, with a scene node, a certain probability of there being a face somewhere in the scene, a probability of text, etc. The model would enable you to generate these, and this would be you know, synthetic samples of text, synthetic samples of faces. So that would be the sort of generation process starting from, uh, uh, you know, starting from this abstract probabilistic model for the scene and then generating it. Now the task of interpreting it would go, would go backwards, would have certain dynamics. You'd have a grammar, you would adjust, you'd have a grammar representation of the scene in terms of these, these nodes and the elements in it. You could do various operations like here. You'd start out by interpreting the image in terms of text and background without realizing there's anyone in the scene. And then over here, you do a move, a translation on the graph, which involves creating a node structure for a face and then explaining that part of the image in terms of the face model. And other types of transformations can be done on this also. I was not planning to go into details of this, this type of thing. If people want to give details, uh, give me feedback. Uh, and the more questions people ask, the more I can adapt to the audience and make sure I'm on the right the right page. Here is a rather more complicated diagram of how a system of that sort would work. Uh, and basically it, it would work in two, two sets of stages. Um, there's sort of a bottom-up component and a top-down one. The bottom-up component would be a system which would look for, um, it would, would be particularly targeted to try and detect or make proposals about the presence of certain important things in the image such as text or faces or any other types of objects. And so for people involved in machine learning, you would have a series of tests, sort of discriminative probability tests. Uh, for example, AdaBoost or methods of that sort are good, uh, you know, often very good procedures for that, uh, which you would train on data and which would look at certain part of the image and say with certain probability, we think there probably is a face there or there probably is text or whatever other types of objects you want to have. These would make proposals into this sort of uh, hierarchical passing representation, which would allow you to um, you know, create models of faces, destroy them, uh, move them around, and so on, up to a high level where there would be more generative models of faces or text, which would sort of interpret what the low level is telling them. Also, the high level models could start making predictions uh, about the locations of certain things in the object or making predictions that, okay, you found a face here, there's certain probability that there ought to be a face over there based on high-level representation. Is there a degree of, uh, I don't know, pixel ownership probabilistically between the low-level uh, component? Uh, there is. The low-level things wouldn't necessarily own pixels. The high level, the generative models should impose that. The low level, you could have competition. You know, something jumps up saying, I think this is a face, and something else is saying, I think, you know, you're wrong, I think it's a tree. But the, the high level stuff, generative, is the thing that really controls it and makes everything fit together uh, and, uh, and so on. Here are some examples of whether, oh, yeah? Well, the low level, no, but many, many of us still have many, many unique parameters. 
Uh, in this version, it only has one, but that's not, uh, yeah. This is, this is a version from two or, th two or three years back that was implemented by Zoe Chu and Alex Chen and so on. So it, it, there's nothing in principle to stop it having more. And some of the ones that uh, Professor Zhu uh, is implementing would have, far more, would have far more nodes of that sort. Um, here is uh, an, an aspect which would illustrate the issue of the, the sort of the bottom up and top down. So here, based on the filters we had several years ago, would be our estimates of what a face is and what a text in the image is. So, okay, so it's getting these faces okay, but it also thinks that this thing is a face. And if you look closely in it, you know, take out the context, it actually doesn't look that different. You know, there's a bit here that looks like an eye, an eye, this could be a nose, that could be a mouth. You know, so it's a plausible thing, you know, plausible error that the system can make. And given the complexity of images, you're you're often going to find things of this sort. You know, if you had a model of a tree or a particular tree thing, that would compete, that would say, hey, this is far more likely to be a tree, you shouldn't have a face there. But at the bottom level uh, of these cues, uh, you know, which are sort of working sort of semi-independently, uh, it's a legitimate thing for a face. And over here, there's another face here, etc. Over here, text here, text here, it thinks this is text. Well, it looks, you know, it's consistent, this could be a bunch of ones and so on. So these sort of discriminative bottom-up approaches are, you know, are not always consistent and they may in certain cases be, be wrong. When you, uh, oh, hang on. Here's the, okay, that's this slide. So here when you have the high levels of generative models, you start uh, resolving, the you know, resolving the ambiguities. These things are now detected as faces but this area here, this is a part of the general region for the tree. It's no longer described as the face itself. And many things are you know, removed. This area here, which was considered to be possible of text, is now described by the high-level generative model as being a type of texture, because that sort of fits it better. Um, over here, the nine, you may not have realized, noticed this nine was not picked up by the lower-level text detection, but it has been found here and is now interpreted as a nine. Okay, so this is giving you the sort of basic uh, sort of strategy of the approach. You would have, you know, images would be composed of patterns. You would have various bottom-up cues, which you would typically learn by, you know, by uh, sort of machine learning approaches. Uh, they would activate hypotheses. These hypotheses would be tested by generative models, and the generative models in turn would try and impose a uniform interpretation of the whole image, which makes everything consistent and uh, happy. Okay, um, now I was going to show you this, which I think I should show on the... Uh, how do I get out of the slide presentation? Escape. Okay, so I may need help of a guy here. And now let's see if I can put up a demonstration here. Okay, so I'm seeing this here. Drag it over to the other, to the left. Okay. 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 Let me just sort of go back here. Go back to the beginning, and sort of make it full screen. Okay. Uh, normal mode. Let's see. I can, I need to push it over here. Move that right over. Ah, damn. Okay, so this is a great low-tech talk. Uh, here is an example of what one can do now, though this is some time further on. And so if you don't know vision, this may not be very impressive. If you do know vision, you should, I think, be pretty impressed by this. So on the left-hand side, there's, there's, there's a video taken just by a founded simple video camera. You go out into the street, you uh, show these, you know, run it around. And on the right-hand side, it's, it's in practically real time. It's detecting text. It is binarizing it. It's, sorry? Uh, well, in some cases, that's, it's... Um, it's not, it's not keeping any memory of what is there from frame to frame. So there were certain 
aspects as it, well as it moves around as it's coming into uh, you know it's into view and um, into focus and then it's coming out of out of focus moving around so some of the text will appear in one image and then will disappear again in the other image nevertheless I think that this is something that is not uh, I don't know anything else that can do it than uh, a method of this type hello what kind of processing power is taken to run this um, it's not a lot actually it's a very Daniel do you know the Run on, um, I think I've had you three or four, uh, but it's, it's only processing, uh, let's see, a few frames, maybe 10 frames per second or something. And, 10? Yeah, maybe. Um, they're relatively low resolution frame. Yeah. And so what, yeah, what this is relying on is having data, you know, data sets of images, learning from that methods for which the, you know, what is distinctive about text, uh, implementing them, and then proceeding on to do binarization, and from here on you go on to, to do uh, recognition. So the systems we have, this would be one of the most, more practical uh, things, uh, things so far. Flickering on, yeah, a bit of sort of history or memory, <laughs> memory that these things existed over time would uh, remove the flicker. But it will make certain mistakes in places which, again, you'll see with the flicker, they'll flicker on and then they'll disappear off later on. Analysis. There's no temporal correlation. There's no temporal correlation, and so yeah, that's the so there, there could actually be improved accuracy if you took into account temporal correlation to get rid of some of the other. Oh, oh yeah, definitely. Yeah. The temporal correlation would make things yeah, that would make things better, uh, definitely. You know, you're using cue, everything here is based on cues, and each picture is sort of producing its own cues, and there's no information from both of them. Yeah. So, it seems to change forms as it flickers around. Is it doing different things in that case? Um, no. We got off um, the example. I mean, sometimes it, it's like it comes out very readable, and sometimes it's very confused. I'm just trying to understand exactly what we're looking at. Uh, it's, I, I mean, it's the nature of the text. Certain of the text is uh, different than others, and some of that also relates to the. Uh, the binarization. I mean, there are two stages in here. One stage is actually doing the detection. Then the binarization is making a limit, limit you know, a certain amount of errors um, in, it, in itself. The text detection, I think, the detection itself, I think, is working extremely, extremely well. Um, the binarization, well, we're working on improving the binarization and the certain rules we have, which are, are good. And then there are certain cases where there are sort of failure modes, which we are then isolating and working on it. Composed in the single frame, no memory mm -hmm. Right. The... We'll do that. Okay. So let's get back to this. Uh, so to get back to this thing, I go. Uh, grab it, just move that over. Um, make that a slideshow and. Uh, Uh, Where are you? Uh, uh, one or two more. I think here and now. Oh, damn, sorry, the mouse has now disappeared. It's on our oh, it's on your screen. Okay, okay, so good, we're here. Okay, so that's, that was, you know, so that was work uh, on uh, basically, we've been concentrating on finding faces and, well, particularly on finding text. Um, now the question is really, how do you go beyond this? Because really, the idea is you want to, you know, you don't just want to find text and faces and things and images, you want to find everything. And everything we had before was relied on having a certain amount of training data. You know, to get the text thing to work, we had to have large numbers of examples of text in real images. and. Uh, so that we could train, so we could get algorithms that could distinguish between the text that actually was text and the parts of images that were, could be anything else that looked like text. And the same thing for faces. 
And so that involves really having enormous numbers of images because you really have to see what there is in the environment that actually uh, could correspond to text. And if you think about it, vision is a fairly strange subject in the fact that no one has ever really characterized what happens in all possible images. You know, in speech, you know, there are a certain number of words that people utter, there are phonemes and so on. There's a fairly basic understanding of what the basic vocabulary is, what the basic inputs are. If you're an astronomer, you know, you study stars, and, you know, you know there are stars, you know there are galaxies, and you know there are dust clouds and a few other things. You know what the basic elements of your domain are. But for vision, there's not really a large amount of knowledge of that. I mean, at one level, you know you're working with images, with pixels, with intensity values, but there's very little understanding of the whole complexities of what actually goes on inside them. And so, um, so my colleague Song Chung Zhu, at, uh, being down at, at Lotus Hill and a certain amount at UCLA, is developing this really uh, fairly ambitious project, which is more or less to take a very large number of images and sort of trying to map them and to understand uh, what, well, actually, what really goes on with them. Essentially, while the work I described so far was based on, you know, the idea of passing images into certain components, he's taking it further on one hand by trying to pass all, you know, enormous numbers of scenes into visual components. On the other hand, at the moment, it's being done more or less interactively. Uh, so it, it first started out a year or so ago with, I think, 20 Chinese art students uh, <laughs> sitting in front of images uh, and hand passing them. And I'll show you some examples later on. And then it's moved more into an interactive approach so that you can uh, spare the art students some of their time by putting in vision algorithms which can find certain structures. And then all the art students have to do is to, uh, you know, to validate that they're correct or not or to make changes. And so certain of the work we did on text was, was made possible by having some of the amounts of data that we got out from this, um, uh, this process. And so once you have these, these representations, well, I think you learn, well, you learn some very big things by having them. One is you, you get this idea of what, uh, of the sort of the structure that images form in, a, in the forms of the, the sort of graphical structures you have. You get the idea of what can happen in all possible images. And then after you've done that, you can use the representations for learning. And then you can also use them for benchmarking. You can see how good the algorithms actually perform and how well they don't. I mean, if you're in the computer vision community, you'll know one problem with computer vision is that while it's easy to come up with an algorithm that works nicely on a few images and you can publish a paper on it, actually getting that algorithm to generalize and to work in very large data sets is a completely different uh, uh, business. So here is an example of a typical Chinese image. I guess uh, he gets some of his funding from China, uh, obviously. And so here is an image. Uh, this is obviously outside the Forbidden City, I think, looking from Tiananmen Square. Uh, and this would be uh, trying to take that scene, segment it at this level, sky, building, flag, et cetera, street lights, portraits, and so on. Then mapping these down with line drawings, line illustrations of all these types of structures. Um, here is the uh, yeah, putting layers, what, what structures are behind which other structures, et cetera. And um, where is the text? You know, this was stuff we were using, for example, uh, labeling these areas as being text, these areas as being Chinese characters, and there should be some here on the top of the bus. And uh, Yeah, that's in, in here. It's a uh, let's see, user interface, um, annotation tools. So this would be the, the Chinese art students. Uh, the algorithms, this would be the Chinese uh, graduate students. And, uh, and then tying it in with the knowledge database and so on. Because the form of the represent, you know, the, the, the representation of the image would be based on a representation that Zhu has defined based on a sort of and or graph type version of a grammar. And now he's sort of initially guessing what that sort of grammar representation ought to be. So they have one version of the grammar. And then based on seeing how well they can describe certain structures, they sort of have to modify it and so on. So it's, in a sense, learning a, a good knowledge representation for the data. Um, and the automation, well, more comes in. You know, of course, in the sense, if you can automate the whole process, then you solve the entire vision problem and there's nothing else to do. <laughs> but there's some way away from that yet. Um, but still, it's interesting to find out which computer vision algorithms are actually useful for something like this.
which is hard, and where they have to work reliably, and which ones are, are not. So where are we? So here is just an example of a sort of representation. So here is the, uh, you know, here's, here is a small element of a, a scene. So, you know, a boy with a backpack, you would, you would draw it at one level, then you would represent it this, more this hierarchical manner in terms of these sort of uh, parts, the container, the handle, the zipper, and so on. Uh, the face would be represented, the, you know, the person, the boy, would be represented in terms of the face, the hair, the ears, the parts, and so on. And all of these would be encoded within this sort of hierarchical data representation structure that uh, Song Chung Zhu and people are, are doing. Uh, here is, I think, another illustration of what one does with, uh, I think, a chair scene. So you're, you know, you're labeling the parts of the chair, you're putting the, you know, here is the, the seat of the chair, the cushion, the back, the light, and so on. Um, uh, I think you know, and the window and so on is in the background. So from these you can uh, both well represent and you could learn methods for detecting chairs. You could also find the sort of probabilistic relationships between certain structures happening in the image, like the chair and the table and so on. This has been sort of talked of in in computer vision, it's something that sort of comes and goes. I remember even when I started vision 20 years ago, there were a schema being developed by uh, Alan Weisman and Hansen, which sort of talked about these issues, but it was practically impossible to do anything like that then. There was no data, there was no real world images that you could really work on, and there was no uh, possibility that you could actually even uh, think of designing algorithms that would work on those types of processes. Okay, where are we here? Street scene. Uh, segmentation, um, Google Earth images, I guess he's got from here, I, I trust with your permission, uh, where take these images, label all the cars and so on, label all the buildings, and uh, get these representations, and then proceed to use these, air, use these domains to build image passing systems uh, based on the principles that I've been, I've been describing. Database, I think this is the size of this is big, uh, certainly by the size used in computer vision. I remember five years ago, databases of 100 images were quite large. Uh, after that, the Berkeley had a database of segmented images, which was about 2,000, which was considered big. Well, here, the total number of images is something like 500,000 so far, I, uh, which Song Chong says are hand annotated. I haven't check them all myself, so I'm not quite sure of uh, performance uh, criteria, but still it is uh, an amazing amount, basing up by looking at the outdoor scenes, indoor scenes, images done by activities, aerial images, uh, and also encoding of various animals, objects, and, and so on. And this is by no means the end point the Institute has been running now for about a year and a half, I think, and 500,000, I think, <laughs> is a big number, but Song Chong is shooting for a lot more orders of magnitude, videos being included. Um, it looks like a, a big proportion of that is video, so um, I, I guess part of what makes this saying is that you can use kind of the natural comparison of the video to segment a lot of that. Yeah, that's, the videos are there, that's, um, yeah, I'm not sure exactly on that how much as that is done by exploiting that, yeah, that property or something, but yeah, there was, apparently there was a number of videos of Chairman Mao's speeches which <laughs> <laughs> he had, which were... Do you know how much time it takes to do one image on average? Uh, I'm not sure exactly. I have, you know, I spent time out there. There are highly motivated people working, you know, eight, nine hours a day just doing these things. It's, I'm glad I'm not doing it myself, but uh, uh, Sung Chong, I'm sure, could give you the figures, figures of doing that. I mean, it's also going to change as soon as, as, soon as you pop, spot him putting the annotation in there and you start just having to, you know, prune things out which are bad. I know, Yu Xiao, have you got any idea? Time? No. So you might have spent a bit of time there? Yeah. And I think also with this process, there's, you know, there's, 
time issues like how, how long do you learn to train the students to do this, this type of thing, etc. And, you know, so the efficiencies which come with time. Okay, so this is, that's sort of part of how one could take the image passing further. You know, one needs to have this data sets, you need to have these types of representations, you need to have this for training, you need to do it for validation, you need to have it for learning all your, all your types of models. Um, okay, here are just a bunch of very, very variety of cats in here. I guess partly I like cats, so I picked one, one example slide there. And then certainly uh, the representations also go into 3D scene labeling, so I've just put in a, a slide of that of that form. Any questions on the data sets? Because I'm now moving on to, uh, I guess, the final uh, part of the talk. Yeah. I guess from the grouping and hierarchy that you have in the various domains, are, are there generalized kind of catch-alls, for instance, under land mammal? Is, it, is there the notion that you can actually build a model that represents a probabilistic match to a land mammal? as opposed to only having the specific models for pig, cat, dog, and you'll, you'll always map to one of those. I, you would like, I'm not sure exact status, you would like to be able to have a generic, as much a generic model as you can, obviously for grounds of, of interpretation. I mean, and, uh, and to the extent that you can find similarities and you'd have a grammar that could, you know, generate a kangaroo with one input and generate something else with another input, that's what you'd like to do, and I frankly I think that's quite practical, um, given you know the fact that all mammals so so you know have very similar structures. There's been work in the past, in fact, work. Well, there's work I did with Song Chung Zhu a long time ago when he was a graduate student, which in uh, sort of a forms representation system, which involved representing things by skeletons and so on. And a lot of other people have worked on that sort of skeleton type representation structure, and so I think it's not impossible to do to do that. Um, I should also say that in terms of detection as well, you know, so for the earlier system that we had published, you know, we built something which would detect faces bottom up, we built something that would detect text bottom up, but you don't really want to build something that detects, uh, you know, of the eight, 10,000 possible objects in the scene individually. You want something that brings out, depends on the, uh, the similarities between them and uh, will function and will output, uh, you know, a number of possible, you know, number of these possible structures. There's been a bit of work done by Bill Freeman at MIT related to that. Uh, Shimon Norman at Weizmann has also considered that issue. But uh, you want to find sort of commonality and sort of build up with ideas of sort of compositionality, putting certain parts together, parts that hopefully reoccur and can be detected uh, individually. So any more? Any? Yeah. Some, some of the objects were referred to in aggregate, like uh, in the maps image, it was a set of cars, it was all one label. Uh, what's the, how do you discriminate between the like, car and uh, what, what uh, constitutes an aggregate? Oh, you would have a number of... Uh yeah, actually, there were some slides which I took out of varieties of cars. You'd have, you'd have a sort of... For that, there was at least a generic car and then a series of sort of uh, spe more specific type cars. And... Um, of quite how that's yeah, func yeah, functioned. I, uh, what was your, yeah? What, would, what was your question more specifically? I mean, it's well, both aspects are being addressed. So, so in, in the Google Maps picture, there yeah. was the, there were single cars labeled on the road. Yeah. And there were also uh, like groups of aligned cars. Yeah. yeah. Aligned cars. Uh, is that is that generally a big problem? I mean, each of those obviously is made up of single. Oh, right, well, then you'd have the hierarchical representation where at the bottom level nodes you'd have the individual cars and then you would have those grouped into, you know, regularities such as rows of cars and then there'd be a node higher up which would be sort of, sort of parking, you know, parking, uh, well, not complete parking lot, but, you know, sub-parting structure and so on and then the whole node higher up which would be the whole parking lot. So the hierarchical modeling is, you know, intended to take care of those, those issues. Yeah? Same recognizer for like the map shots as you would for a, a ground level scene shot, or are they separate? Uh, they would be separate. Okay. I mean, yeah, they have. I yeah, no. I mean, the cues in common are. I think yeah, the viewpoints are just too different for that to be to be done. 
OK, so now I want to get in some other, uh, for the last part of the talk, I want to get in some other talk with another person called Zhu, but this is a graduate student, Zhu Long. So uh, not to be confused with Song Chong. I'm told the Chinese character is actually different, even though the anglicized version, Zhu, is, is, is the same. So here is an attempt to learn probability grammars in an unstructured way just from input images. So here we're not relying on uh, the types of detailed segmentations uh, and annotations that Song Chong's group has, is producing because, well, they weren't around when we were <laughs> starting this work. And in any case, one would like to see how far one can go without having to have hordes of Chinese graduate students do, do that type of work for you. Uh, and so we're addressing work in the Caltech 101 data set that I guess a number of people may know. So here, this was set up at Caltech by um, Fei Fei Li working with Pietro Perona, and uh, she got 101 different categories. I think apparently Pietro told her to get more than 100, so she went up to 101 and, <laughs> and stopped there. Uh, and so this data set, though, you know, it's, it's simple compared with what Song Chung is producing and the certain criticisms of, of it, but still it's, it's, it's considered a good state of the art. You know, it's, it's something that people are starting to use and compare results on. And so here's certain of the objects you have in it, and this is, you know, chair, cougar, et cetera, and below certain of our recognition results performed on it. The important thing perhaps for us so much isn't so much the, you know, the quality of the performance, which is, you know, which is, is, is fairly good, but it's more the concepts behind it, at least for this part of the talk. So you think of having a probabilistic model or grammar that could generate these objects. And so the way these things are done is you're given a series of images, and in each image there is an object. And it's, uh, you know, a face, but you do not know where it is in the image, and you don't know what the background is, and the background is fairly complicated. So it's called, I think Pietro Perona caused it unsupervised learning, uh, so it's not quite fair. It's more sort of semi-supervised, but still you don't have the detailed knowledge of where the boundary of the face is or the particular position or the size or the scale. So the idea is that you try and learn a grammar incrementally um, from these sets of images. And so the first thing you would do is you assume that the image is just sort of purely background. It's sort of the default model. It's sort of like it's random. That corresponds schematically to this graph structure here. the sort of just a background generating the image, and that's it. I should say the, this work here initially is done just on feature points extracted from the image, and later on is generalized. Uh, but so just you can think of these as feature points in the image uh, to start out with. You take the image, you run an interest point detector on it, you end up with 40 feature points, something like that, and you want to explain them. And they have attributes like the appearance properties and so on, and you're using methods like Cahir, Brady, uh, SIF descriptors and so on. So you start out by, by this default model. So that's a rather boring model, but it's where you need to start out with. So then you start seeing, can you find more structure, more regularities in the image, which are sort of more likely than the data just being generated by this sort of independent model? OK, so here you start doing it in terms of combinations of triplets of features, triplets being quite useful because from triplets of features, you can get properties that are invariant to the orientation and to the scale. So you don't need to have those things fixed. Uh, then you see whether this model will explain it better than this. Then you grow this model uh, to a more complex one, see can you explain it better, and so on. And you keep on adding new features, adding more elements to this graph, to this grammar, uh, while you're still able to, you know, while your, your ability to explain the data goes up, you'll carry on adding extra features in here. So you'll sort of grow your grammar um, over, over time with the data. Um, I don't know, people are probably maybe familiar with Adaboost, so, you know, Adaboost algorithm, you do feature selection, you use a certain number of weak classifiers to do a task, and then there's a procedure which decides what's the best new weak classifier to add on and into the system. Well, this is a little like this, except it's rather more complicated, uh, because you're here, you're learning uh, how to increase the structure of a very general probabilistic model, uh, rather than just a, a sort of a classifier like Adaboost. So, grow up with those things here, and you know the details of this are, you know, uh, well I can describe them later to people who are who are sort of interested. But this gives you, I hope, the basic sort of idea. 
From that, you could learn a grammar of the object, and this grammar is not a very, uh, is a fairly simple one at the moment because it's based on feature points. It would be comparable to the types of models somewhat that have done by Perona and Fergus and the constellation models, if people are perhaps familiar with that literature. But there's a difference here. Everything here is learned completely unsupervised, and um, the grammars we're getting here, you know, the, the models that Pietro and the, and the other people get have sort of fixed numbers of points. Here with the grammar, you're able to have different numbers of points depending on different aspects of the object. So the motorbike can be decomposed into this type of aspect appearance for it. Here is another form of appearance. Here is another. And depending on the amount of viewpoint variation, you could have other aspects being uh, developed as well. Another, important, another sort of advantage of this trace is, is also once you've learned it, how can you do the inference? And the form of the grammar is set up so that doing the inference is very fast. So for example, to, uh, so once you've learned this structure, performing the inference to find out if there is a motorbike in the image or not is done in about one second, which by the speeds of what you can do, uh, you know, what alternative methods here can do is, 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 very, is very fast moving towards uh, practicality of, of real-time efforts. Uh, three tasks, this was a little bit more, this is just to bring out the main sort of different task. One is, once you have learned this probabilistic model, how you do inference, which would mean involve detecting the object in the image, uh, passing it, finding its boundary. Uh, the other would be sort of learning the parameters of the model when the structure of the model is fixed. And the other is structure learning, where you allow the grammar to grow uh, based, on, uh, you know, based on, the, on the data. So there are three different tasks related here. The inference is the part that's really fast. The parameter learning part is, is reasonably quick. Structure learning is a bit slower of the order of several hours, but that's something that you do offline in any case. And here, just to say some of the algorithms involved, you're using EM, you're using dynamic programming, saddle point. There's a certain range of techniques sort of put in there to do that, that task. So here, coming up with, uh, again, more examples. Uh, roosters, pianos, uh, et cetera, faces, aeroplanes, and so on. Now, this, these, these methods are, I say, effective. Here's invariance to rotation and scale. I'll skim over that because we're getting short. But the form of the representation enables it to, to do that thing quite well. Um, here is sort of, I think, conceptually interesting. Um, is that if you don't say what is in the image, it will start learning the models uh, individually as different branches of the grammar. So before you would give an image which would be, there'd be a face in there somewhere and you'd have that information there was a face in there. Now we're saying, when we're making it weaker, there's an image, somewhere there is a face, or it could be a plane, or it could be a motorbike in the image. And then it will learn the grammar and one part of the grammar will correspond to the plane, one to the face, one to the motorbike. So it will start learning that there are different types of objects automatically without you being told it. OK. Now, these results here are, I think they're good, and they're sort of comparable or, or maybe better to the current state of the art of the representations, which are based on representing objects by interest points. But interest points are only a very, you know, they're a sparse representation of the object. And you are only getting a limited amount of information from them. You're getting quite a lot of, in, you know, you're getting ability to do certain tasks, like certain classification tasks seem to be possible based on interest points, because a grand piano and a face, you know, they may look very different just based on the interest points. But if you want to get form more fine scale resolution, or if you want to actually find the boundaries of the objects, you have to go to a richer set of vocabularies. So the next stage is to say, OK, we don't just represent the image in terms of the feature points. You represent them in terms of uh, interest points. Then you add extra features, like it could be a sort of a mask for the whole shape of the object. Uh, it could be edgelets. And as we can move forward with this, we could start putting in extra features. So eventually, one would hope to get enough features so that you could really represent the object completely. The interest points are very good places to start because they sort of in, have nice invariant properties. There are small numbers of them. They can get you started. They can get you, uh, you know, they can tell you roughly how big the object is. They can tell you the orientation, et cetera. Once you have those, 
these other features can be applied. So over here, we start out with the basic objects, just using interest points. We find the interest points, and that interest points sort of start telling you roughly where the image should be. So here is a box based around the interest points of the star of this uh, thing. Here is one based on the interest points you found here. So they locate a certain area from that. Then from this, automatically, you can start hypothesizing a shape, a model for the shape of the object, given, again, 100 examples. And you can learn that by doing inference of where that would be using certain information from the inside of the object and from the outside of the object. Again, sort of purely, uh, um, purely unsupervised. And so from that, you end up being able to learn masks of the object, uh, which are reasonably good. They're going to screw up some places, like with the chair. They're not quite getting the legs of the chair very accurately. But nevertheless, they're getting a fairly good, uh, for most of the objects, they're getting a pretty good model of the shape uh, uh, of it. And so you're going here from sort of the basic, very sparse interest points to a probabilistic model of the shape, and then you're adding in edges and so on. So I'm hoping that with this method, by adding more, more features, you can sort of bootstrap your way up until you have a model that generates not just the interest points and the mask and the features, but it could generate maybe the appearance of the objects as well. And so with this, you can not only do things like classification, which is what people do on the Caltech database, and get numbers for this, which are good or you know, slightly, you know, better or something than the other things, but also you can get methods for the detection for the positions of the boundaries and so on. And I think this would address one of the concerns with the Caltech thing is that though there were large numbers of objects in the data set, they're not really representative of the domain. And so uh, if you compare it, say, to the work on text detection, which we've done a lot on, you know, we had to get examples of text, and then we had to get lots and lots of examples of things that were not text in the image, you know, t thousands, tens of thousands, even more non-text things to find out anything that you could confuse with text. And so if you take the Caltech 101 data set and you take the interest point models we have or the models that other people have, sure, they'll work quite well on the Caltech 101 data set, but there's going to be a lot of other things out there in the world that they're going to mix up with these objects because they have too limited, too restricted a representation of the data. You know. So hopefully with what we're doing here, though, as you add on more features, as you use the interest points just to get started, you add on more and more features, and that allows you to discriminate better and better between these objects and everything out there. And then also it enables you to find the boundaries and do every other thing that you want with it. Finding the boundaries, doing the passing, you know, saying, hey, that's not just a grand piano, but there are the legs, you know, here are the keys, etc." So that would be one uh, goal. So I guess I'm finishing more or less on time. So here would be the conclusion slide. So generally, our, the group, uh, you know, our Harvard group, the Center for Vision, Image and Vision Science, myself and Song Chang, were interested in formulating problem tasks like image passing using sort of probabilistic grammars for objects and objects patterns with high-level models of structure, low-level uh, models sort of acting to, uh, you know, in a sort of bottom-up, top-down method to, uh, uh, you know, to uh, use a low-level uh, uh, cues to test the high, you know, to activate the high-level models, which would then be checked, confirmed, and make everything consistent. And I think where we've gone furthest on this so far with something that's pretty good is the automatic detection and binarization of text. We're then moving on to these other things. So Song Chong's huge genome project of images where uh, with all these art students and extracting these uh, data sets and getting these hierarchical representations by hand and using them for training and for testing, et cetera. And then this other work I'm describing at the end, the issues of whether, how far you can go with learning these grammars in an unsupervised way without having to <laughs> get Chinese art students to give you clues uh, part of the way. So um, I think you know, hopefully these, these aspects come together and one can develop, um, get very powerful methods. Um, this talk has been mainly about computer vision. I, I should say I'm also very interested in how the brain does these types of things. And I was, earlier this week, I was at a meeting at NSF in Washington where, you know, issues of how you would attack the brain or model the brain from all different perspectives, sort of from physics, computer science, statistics, and so on, were coming out. And so I guess I was also arguing there for this as a type of model that you could have. You know, we're trying to build here a system that is as sophisticated, more or less, as a human visual system. 
and one can try and see whether certain of the aspects of this relate to the properties that we know about the human brain and how it's organized and you know uh, whether something like this could be both sort of tested, validated, confirmed or uh, or I could find out that the brain is doing something different, better, or possibly something worse. Who knows? So I think it, you know, it ties in here, and it could also start using as a model for uh, a sort of uh, theoretical sort of neuroscience-type model capable of, of some tests. Anyway, well, thank you very much for your attention, and uh, yeah. Uh, they could use mo most things. The, it's only the one at the end was starting off with the interest points. The, the things at the beginning for the faces, that, was, that could be patches, that could be any, any type of description that is, yeah, any, anything that one can, can put in there. So there's no restriction to interest points. You really want to be able to explain the whole image. Uh, no, not well. You'd have a. I mean, if you were trying to recognise a face, you'd have a generative model for what a face would look like, which you would learn by training data, by having, you know, a, a little bit like act, for the face would be a bit like the active appearance model. So you'd have some sort of spatial warp, some models of the intensity, and so on. The patches there could come in as sort of possible cues. If you could statistically show that certain patches were highly likely to be present where there was a face then that would be a useful feature that you could put into a bottom-up Adaboost detector. But that would be there merely to drive the activation of the top-level generative, generative model to, uh, to validate and to confirm it. Yeah. So I had a question around, uh, I'll call it viewpoint sensitivity. Although you had a, an objective you know, rotation and scale invariance, that was for a given viewpoint on the original image. So there, that, I, I'm, I was looking through the Caltech yeah. 256 database just now, browsing the images, yeah. and it seemed as if very often the image of the object always respected what might be called the principal axis of the object. Yeah. That you never saw a book face on like this and then edge on like this and expected it to both recognizes the book. So right. Is there a precision recall sensitivity issue in terms of the, the perturbation from this trained viewpoint? Well, um, there isn't, but of the system I described, it should be able to deal with that by having a grammar, one aspect being for what the book would look like from front on, another for what it would look like from side on. So at the top of the graph, Given the right training data, yeah, there's a issue. Um, I don't know if I could. It's not clearly shown here, but but uh, oh, those are different types. But um, uh, planes, no, it's not, there's nothing here which really quite demonstrates it. But here would be, you know, this would be like an or graph, or it could look like this, or this, or this. So if you had enough training data, it could happen automatically. Um, there is an issue though of whether you are wh whether that is the ideal thing to do, or whether there are similarities between the representation here and the representation of other angles, that by going to a full 3D representation you would, you would go away with. Um, so at the moment, yeah, given enough training data, this, would, this sort of thing should work, should deal with that. But there could be a smarter, more, you know, not, more better representation. It represent the underlying physics in terms of the light field. Yeah. It, it keeps on coming up. I mean, there's an issue about certain of the machine learning techniques are very data intensive. You know, you rely a lot on them. There's knowledge of how humans learn. You know, humans seem to learn very quickly from one or two examples and then they generalize. And babies do it, you know, enormously well. And so that seems to be, there's interesting work being done by Josh Tenenbaum and people at MIT on that. Not directly in vision, but on the issue of how humans learn concepts. And it does seem there that in his sort of models, you've got a more structured representation, which means that, you know, once you're, you're it, you know, gives you more of the, well, more of the structure and allows you to generalize more easily from small number of examples. And so I think that's an area that I'm sort of partly trying to push themselves in at the moment, since having enough data <laughs> works, <laughs> we know how to do it. I'm, 
Um, but still, it would be certainly more elegant and more effective in the long term to get at that sort of, those invariant sort of issues. And uh, that's a, it's a, a challenging you know, scenario of importance at the moment. Yeah. So um, I guess I'm just curious how close this is to be in production quality. If I wanted to say find text in Google Images, what what would the what are the issues standing in the way of doing that in a useful way? Uh, I think the finding text would work pretty pretty well. I would say, since we've tested on large numbers of things, uh, the there's the finding text, there's the binarization, and then there's reading the text. The finding the text, I think, goes, it goes pretty well. Back on that. Binarization, still, we're sort of work, you know, that's working pretty well, but there were certain failure modes that one detects. And again, with more data set and more labeled images, you find ways around those. Um, the reading of text, I mean, we've sort of, yeah, we've taken the outputs of these things, you put them into OCR systems like ABBYY or things like that. And it's surprising how often those systems fail, even when we give it binarization that looks very, looks, you know, that looks very good. So at some level, I think the limitation is, you know, of those things is the, the text detection, system, uh, the text reading systems, which were after all designed to be done on sort of, uh, you know, they're designed to be done on documents like these. They're not designed to be done on real-world images. And I think the limitations are those. If you want to find the text, if you want to binarize it and put it into a system, then I think this is pretty, you know, th these, things work, these things work pretty well. For the other aspects, uh, other things I think we have not spent so much time on or developed so far. And they, you know, and partly it has been an aspect of having the data. You know, text detection stuff we started working on, I don't know, five, six, seven, eight years back, we started getting images, we started with you know, small numbers, we tested, we expanded, et cetera, et cetera. With these other things, it's only in the last year and a half that Song Chong has got these people to get these types of images and to go forward. Also, it gets into this issue of variability. Text, the amount of variability is not as much as there would be for a deformable object like a, a panda or something like that. <laughs> so uh, the more deformable it is, Unless you have a good knowledge representation system that sort of is able to deal with that, the more deformed it is, the more data you're going to need to do it. So how hard would it be to generalize to stylize things like logos and stuff, where they take normal text and they intentionally make it unique? Yeah, uh, those, yeah those can be frustrating sometimes. Uh, I think we, on those we do surprisingly well, except there were certain particular cases where you find uh, where, you, where there were some slight problems. If the boundaries are done, you know, well, for example, the text stuff is based on black and white images. If you have color images where the, it, you know, the text is green on, on red and the intensity is almost exactly the same, then the system is not able to do that. I, I think there's, you know, again, with a bit of training or a bit of putting in certain cues for those things, I don't think there's going to be too much of a problem for those as far as the detection stage and maybe the binarization stage. Um, but certainly, uh, yeah, those are, have been frustrating in the past. Yeah. So in your grammar, uh, so ideally each of the uh, all branch so should be one type of, uh, let's say, face. So could it be possible so for one branch, a human face mixed with uh, maybe a cougar face? Or <coughs> Well, if you showed the person if you showed the person cougar images mixed together with face images and uh, just learnt it, I it would be quite yeah. We haven't done that. <laughs> Maybe we should try it and see what see what happens. Uh, although cougar faces and human face well, um, the other issue is that at the level of interest points, cougar faces and human faces are a bit similar. I mean, they're different enough so that when you learnt the model they are able to distinguish between them. But in the stages where you're trying to learn it without telling the difference between the cougar and so on, it might not work just with the interest points. I think once you start putting in the other stuff, it's going to, it's going to go a lot better. But um, with interest points alone, you might get mixed up until you've gone far enough to learn the, uh, to learn the, full, the full model. Okay, thank you.